I thought I'd ask you a seasonal question because, you know, given what we've been enduring over the last week or so, um, this has been a question that's on my mind. I, it happens that my birthday is next month, and so I know that September is a very rainy time of year. And you guys know, like, they talk, they talk about the spring rains and all that kind of thing. So, yes. But why have we got so much rain now when we got, like, we didn't even get as much, that much rain during winter? Ah, that's a great, that's a really great question. Um, I don't have a, not being a meteorological expert, I don't have a straightforward answer for you. I could guess some answers, but I think as we discuss this, we might come up with some suggestions. So, if I were to pose this question, right, how many days will it rain next month? There are kind of two broad ways that we can answer this question. Two ways that we can try and get towards uh, a number, right? So, the first way that you could make a prediction is based on just what you know about what's happening right now. I guess I would call that current knowledge, right? Like you look around, you take some measurements, all that kind of thing, okay? So for instance, you might say, well, just, you know, what's the temperature? Because you guys probably are aware there is a connection between the temperature in the air and therefore how much water it can hold in it. Um, and so therefore, if you know what the temperature is, that gives you a better idea of, you know, the probability of rain. Not just temperature. Does anyone know what it's called? Like the actual amount of water in the air hanging around? Start to the humidity. Very good. So when we say, oh, it's super humid, um, that means there's lots of moisture in the air. Like it doesn't, you can't see it because it's in the air. Um, but nonetheless, it's there and the more that's there, the more likely it is to rain. Okay. Um, there are other things you can talk about. Like they talk about um, uh, air pressure. So you use a barometer for that kind of thing, air pressure. What happens is that air pressure defines where air is flowing from in between. So if you've got lots of high air pressure in a particular area, then air from other areas can't come into it, right? Um, whereas if you have low pressure, it's sort of sucking in air from other places which might be dry or it might be wet, so that affects things. You got other things like, for example, you might, if you watch the news report, right, they'll show you the big picture of Australia and then they superimpose some images on it. What images do they superimpose on top of the map? Does anyone know? Yeah. Yeah, cold fronts, um, hot, hot fronts. Um, yeah, Ethan, another suggestion? It's warm fronts, actually. Yep, um, say, thank you, yeah. warm fronts. And they like also do like little boxes which have the temperature of each Yeah, city, good. Like, so, like uh, Sydney, all Yep, good. Um, they talk about minimums and yeah, maximums. Yeah, another suggestion? So, so wind, okay, wind, and I'm gonna put another one on that. Um, wind direction and cloud cover, right? Because obviously, if there are no clouds around, there's not going to be rain, right? Not magical rain coming out of nowhere. So if they look at satellite photography and they see this kind of thing, right? Or there's like a, you know, a, a hurricane off the coast of somewhere, they're like, ooh, okay, likelihood of rain. Um, there's one more thing. Uh, there's kind of this trend that uh, has a Spanish name or has two trends which have Spanish names. Does anyone know what it's called? Yeah, what do you reckon? I don't know what you mean, but it's yeah. precipitation. Uh, okay, so, so precipitation is our name for, is our fancy name for, for rainfall, uh, right? So they say chance of precipitation, by which they mean how likely is it to rain, okay? So that's just, just a fancy word. Now, um, the trend I was referring to, precipitation, uh, that Italian thing is either called La Nina or, does anyone know the other one? Ethan. El. <laughs> El Nino. Uh, it's funny. It's a funny story. It's Spanish for little girl and little boy. That's literally what it means. Uh, but it's referring to something that's happening um, globally, which uh, talks about whether there's going to be lots of rain, like monsoon weather, that kind of thing, or, or not very much like droughts. Okay. So that's all current knowledge. It's like, if you know what's going on now, can you make a prediction about the future? That's one way. Okay. But there is another bigger trend, and it's often what gets used to answer this question. As opposed to stuff that you know now, current knowledge, you might instead choose to use future. stuff that you know, well, we're trying to guess about the future, right? But often the future is best guessed by thinking about what's happened in the past, right? Because seasons, right, the whole idea of seasons, the fact that our planet spins round and round and round, and it's going round and round the sun over and over again, you would expect predictability based on what's happened in history, right? So for instance, if what you're interested in is September, right? You could say, like, what about, what about last year? What about September 2014? What happened then? How about September 
2012. Yeah. Wasn't it? Really? Was it really rainy or was it really sunny, which is weird? I, I remember it being a really, really I, I honestly can't remember. You have better memory than I do. Okay, But the whole point is, we can look back, right? Looking back one year is one thing. We could look back further and say, um, are there trends? For instance, if you compare all of the Septembers for the last... We've actually been recording weather information, the Bureau of Meteorology, has been doing it for decades, right? So perhaps we might see, oh... Over the last 30 years, September's been getting rainier and rainier and rainier. We had like 10 days of rain and then 11 and then 12 and so on, right? So if there's a trend based on what's happened in the past, historically, we can use that to predict. Now, these two approaches, they have different names. And they're names that you've kind of heard of, but I want to formalize today. What we call this is theoretical probability. Right? Like in theory... In theory, knowing all these things, can we make a guess, right? In theory. This is something quite different, right? It's like you've run a big scientific experiment and you're looking at the observations, you're looking at the data you've recorded. Since it's like doing an experiment, we call this experimental probability. But hasn't that already happened? Yes, that's exactly right. But the thing is, right, what? if it's already happened, that's a really good indication of what's going to happen in the future, right? Because it's like, oh, it just so happens that every December, the temperature is like over 30 degrees for the majority of the month. It happened last December, December. and the December before that, and the December before that, at least because we're in the Southern Hemisphere anyway. So therefore, yes, it's happened in the past, but it gives you a good indication for what's going to happen in the future. Right? Yeah. But doesn't that like, where climate change kind of screws that whole thing out. Yes, yes, it does affect, but, but at the same time, it doesn't mess with it completely because when you're looking at the past, you can think about, well, how is it changing, right? That's, that's what we mean by trends, okay? So if we notice something is happening more and more and more or less and less and less, we can still take account of that, right? Maybe not perfectly, but, you know, we don't necessarily need a perfect answer to that. We're just using mathematical tools to get to a rough idea, okay? Now, I want to think about these terms based on what you already know. Okay, so theoretical probability, right? If I say, I'll uh, ask you to roll a die, roll a die, we know that the probability of getting, say, I don't know, a three, the probability of rolling a three, theoretically, should be... One out of six, one out of six right? One out of six, just the three, because there's only one, there's only a single three on there, and there are six possible outcomes. So we call these favorable outcomes on the top, and then we say there's sample space on the bottom. In fact, I'm going to write that down and so should you. What Favorite you outcomes. Title, um, I'll tell you the title in a second. Actually, the title is there. I'll just finish writing this. The, the title is this idea here, experimental probability. Okay. Now, it, theoretically, we would say one out of six. But experimentally, bless you. Experimentally, if I hand you a particular die and you're like, hold on. I play, I play Watch Out for Voldemort on this. I know, I always had trouble rescuing, I don't know, whoever it was, like Hermione or something like that. It's like, I pretty much never rescued her, okay? So maybe something's up with the particular die I gave you. Maybe it was a, does anyone know what it's called when it's unfair? Rigged. Uh, rigged, usually it's called a loaded die, which is, uh, which is the same it's as rigging it. Like because all weighted, side. right? So one of the signs perhaps has more like, plastic or metal or something heavy in it so when you roll it, it that generally goes on the bottom okay. so what we might do is instead of that we might say look the probability of a three okay come in take a seat the probability of a three right suppose i roll a hundred times actually no, that's that's a that's a hard number let me give you a better number suppose i rolled 60 times okay 60 times okay Chain. Chain. Not necessary. We've talked about that. Okay. Suppose I roll 60 times, right? So out of 60, out of 60, how many would you normally expect in theory would be threes? How many would you expect? 10. 10, Ten out of 60 is the same as 1 out of 6. But suppose you roll and roll and roll and roll, right? And instead of getting 10, you only get 7. Now, that's not outrageous. That's not like, oh, this is completely unfair. But it's also not exactly what we would have predicted based on our current knowledge of like, well, there's six faces, and one of them's a three, so I expect one out of six. So this is what happens after we did our experiment, okay? Now, therefore, the top and bottom are different. 
it's not just favorable outcomes in sample space, right? This seven is how many threes did I actually roll, right? How many favorable outcome events actually happened, right? And that word actually is critically important. This is not about saying, oh, I think this should happen. This is about what actually took place when I rolled the thing, okay? That's how many times I got the three. What's the 60 represent? Yeah, how many times did I try? How many, um, how many trials were attempted? Right? How many trials were attempted? And again, it's important that they're actually done, right? That's 60. Uh, in fact, as a class, I think you guys did way more than 60 rolls, okay? That's where this number comes from. Now from this, there's a couple of um, ideas that go with this. Remember I asked you, based on the theoretical probability, how many threes would you expect? Expect, And we said 10, right? So we can get an expected frequency from theoretical probability, or we could get an expected frequency from experimental, right? So expected frequency. Okay. So this idea of how many times do you expect, you can get it either way. And you get different numbers based on which path you take. Okay? So for example, for example, if I rolled it, let's pick a harder number this time. Okay? If I roll 100 times, okay, in theory, theoretically, we expect... How many threes? Now this time, because it's an awkward number, right? It's not like a multiple of six. How am I going to do it? Well, I would expect exactly a sixth of the 100 rolls, right? Exactly a sixth of them, right? So if I go a sixth, right? And then I multiply that by 100, it gives me 16.66666 repeater, okay? Now, I can't get like a quarter or a half or two thirds of a roll. So what would you say is your expected frequency if I got 16.666? I, I would round up, wouldn't I? Because it's closer to 17 than it is to 16. So theoretically, we expect 17 um, rolls to be three. Okay, but we did the experiment, apparently, right? And something else happened, right? So I would say instead, experimentally, <coughs> We expect not a sixth of the rolls, but seven sixtieth of the rolls, right? So again, I'm going to take my calculator. I'm using my calculator because these are such awkward numbers here, right? I'll go seven over 60, and then I'm going to multiply that by my 100 rolls, right? And that gives me 11.666. So if it's 11.666, it's closer, to, it's closer to 12 than 11, isn't it? So I expect this many which is less, because that's what the experiment told me, okay? So, this idea of comparing like ideal, perfect circumstances versus what actually happens, okay? That's what these two categories are thinking are about, and they give you different results. And so you always need to say which one's which. Am I thinking about it in theory, or am I thinking about it as an experiment, okay?